Hi, everyone. Welcome back. Uh, on behalf of the Russell Sage Foundation, the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation, and Duke University, it's my pleasure to welcome you back to the Summer Institute in Computational Social Science. And hello again to everyone tuning in on the live stream. So today, we're going to talk about uh, mass collaboration. So uh, we'll have a lecture and discussion about mass collaboration, then a break, and then you all will get to participate in a mass collaboration uh, called the Fragile Families Challenge. We'll have time for lunch. Then you will continue with the Fragile Families Challenge. We'll have a debrief, a break, and then uh, our visiting speaker will start at 4 o'clock, Sendhil Mullenathan. That is going to be a fantastic talk, so I hope you all are excited for that. OK, so based on the feedback that we've been receiving, I'm going to try to cut down on the lectures to leave more time for the activities so the days feel less compressed. Uh, most of what I want to say about mass collaboration, I've already said. I've written it down in bit by bit, and so uh, if there's stuff that you want to learn more about, I would recommend reading chapter five. Uh, so I want to use my time here to review some of what I think are the main points and uh, emphasize certain things that I think are sometimes uh, overlooked about mass collaboration. So I want to talk about how I see mass collaboration fitting into the overall way that uh, we do social research. So when I was working on bit by bit, it's sort of organized in these sequence of designs where the researcher plays a larger and larger role. So initially, there's observing behavior. This is what most big data sources are. In this case, the researcher has no interaction with the participants and plays no role in shaping the data that gets created. Then you can have a slightly more active design where you actually ask people questions. And there are certain things that you can learn by asking people questions that you can't learn just by observing their behavior. Then the sort of next stronger design would be running experiments where you randomly assign people to conditions and deliver treatments to them. And there are certain things that you can learn by running experiments that you can't learn by doing surveys or just observing people's behavior. And so all of these designs generally involve researchers studying people. And I think what's very exciting about mass collaboration is that we kind of rebalance that dynamic and we say, let's bring these people into the research process. Like, what could we do if instead of studying people, we were collaborating with them? And what kinds of things could we accomplish if we had this collaboration on a massive scale? So I think the best example of what is possible with mass collaboration is Wikipedia. So many of you have used Wikipedia. Everyone, I think, has used Wikipedia. Uh, and it's amazing. And it shows, I think, what is possible when many people from all over the world can work together on something. And if we imagine that now there are so many people in the world with so many special skills who all can be connected together through the internet, what is it that we could all do together? So imagine just take the, the 30 of us in this room. Like imagine if we all did one thing. You all are going to do group projects next week. What if you all did your group project together? I would guess that the 30 of you working together in one week could do something amazing. And what if we had all the partner institutes working together? And what if we had even more people from all over the world? So big things in the world require usually lots of people. And so now we have potentially new ways to have lots of people working together on research projects. So the I think that a lot of the way that I think about mass collaboration is informed by sort of three different streams of research that um, sort of overlap and reinforce each other. So the first is research about crowdsourcing. And crowdsourcing, the main idea is you take a task that's normally done inside of your organization or maybe your research group, and you sort of outsource it to a crowd. There's a second related uh, area of research around what's called citizen science. And citizen science is mainly focused on bringing citizens into the scientific process, as if scientists are not themselves citizens. Um, and then the third thing um, that I think mass collaboration draws from is research about collective intelligence. 
So collective intelligence is largely about how we can organize groups of people to work together to do things that uh, are as if intelligent. Uh, and so I'm going to kind of blend all of those together, and I'm going to refocus them much more on what I think is important for social science research, less about what's important for governments or companies. And so I like to sort of split up this space into three main buckets. Um, there are many ways to divide this space. This is the division that I've come up with that I think is most useful for social research. Um, and so we have sort of three main areas. The first is human computation. So these are things where you have a, a relatively easy task, but you have a very big scale. And so the difficulty comes from the scale, not from the task itself. So a classic example of this is Galaxy Zoo, where they had uh, thousands of volunteers help label galaxies about whether they were spiral or elliptical. So it turns out it's relatively easy to label galaxies. It doesn't, you don't need to be an uh, astronomical researcher. With a little bit of training, everyone here could label these galaxies. Um, but the difficulty comes from the fact that they had uh, close to a million images uh, that needed to be labeled. Uh, so then these are the kinds of problems that in the past researchers might have asked undergraduates to do, let's say. Um, a second kind of problem is what I would call an open call problem. So in this case, the difficulty comes not from the scale, but from the problem itself. And so if you have a problem that's really hard, you might not even know how to solve it, even if you had unlimited amounts of time. And so you can open up this question to many people, and hopefully they can submit a solution to you. This works really well when you have problems that are easy to state and where the solutions are easy to verify. And having solutions that are easy to verify is very, very unusual in social science now. So if you think about when you're asked to review a paper, think how long that takes to decide whether this paper is correct or not correct, doing what it says it's doing or not. And often there's disagreement about whether the paper is doing what it's doing or not. That's an example of something that's not easy to verify. But if I said to you, like, make a battery that uh, can run without recharging for 100 straight hours using this machine, then you can give me that battery, I can put it in the machine, and I can see how long it lasts. So it's easy to verify everyone can agree on whether we've done it or not done it, if we've posed the question correctly. So I think increasingly in social science we'll be able to pose questions in this way so that we can open up and be, take inputs from many, many more people. A classic example of this is the Netflix Prize. Um, the third, may, uh, the Netflix Prize, let me explain what that is. Uh, so many of you may, may be familiar with this already. The Netflix Prize, Netflix wanted to improve their ability to recommend movies to people, and so they released a large amount of data about people's movie ratings and then asked uh, people out in the world who didn't work at Netflix to try to build an algorithm that would be able to predict what ratings people would give to movies. So the task is very clear, predict what ratings people will give to movies. The way that you would achieve this task is not clear. The third main category is uh, what I would call distributed data collection. And this is cases where um, the main role that these participants play is in actually collecting your data for you. So most data collection now in surveys, for example, is a form of distributed data collection. Usually. If you were going to run a large survey, face-to-face -face survey, let's say, you would hire a company, they would hire staff, those staff would go out and interview people, and that's how you would collect your data. Now, there are increasing opportunities for this data collection to be done by volunteers. This introduces a number of other problems about data quality, but there are ways of potentially addressing those problems. And by having large-scale volunteer data collection, you can potentially work at a scale that's much different than what you could do um, by hiring a company. And so a classic example of this is eBird, which is an ornithology project. Uh, so every day there are people out in the world looking at birds as a hobby. That's people like looking at birds. And then they write down what birds they see. And that's part of the culture of birding. And prior to eBird, most of this valuable data about 
bird prevalence was just sitting on notebooks in people's houses. And the people in eBird said, let's make a system where people can upload this data to us, and then this will give us information about especially migration of birds at a global scale. So it's interesting, ornithology has this culture of mass collaboration and citizen science in part because it is impossible to study bird migrations at your own university. So, right, it, many of you can do your research sitting in your office uh, or maybe with students at your university, but that is not possible if you want to study bird migration. You need to have larger scale collaborations. And so they have this um, tradition in their field, which I think is wonderful. So those are the three sort of main buckets, and we'll get, uh, um, I'll give you a lecture about sort of each of these areas and go into more detail about them. So I do want to provide, though, before going into each specific one, provide some sort of overall orienting perspective. So for me, I think it's very important when we talk about mass collaboration to think of these people as collaborators and not as cogs in our machine. So some people, when they think about human computation or putting things on Mechanical Turk, it often uh, treats the other people who are involved as cogs in some big algorithm or process. And I think there's the more exciting stuff to me personally comes from thinking of these people as collaborators. And I think there are great traditions of this in ornithology, as I mentioned, and also astronomy, where there's been a long tradition of citizen science doing observations of different things in the sky. So I'll try to take this collaborator's approach rather than a COGS approach in what I talk about today. One question that sometimes people ask me is, is this really research? Like, if you're designing a system to, to solve a problem, then maybe you're not really solving the problem yourself. All these other people are solving the problem. Is that really research? So to me, the answer to this is, Let's think about whether this enables new research. So if you have a scientific question and there is a process through which you can solve that scientific question, then that is research. It might not look like the research that we're used to seeing where we sit in our office and analyze some data, but the process of so organizing people to solve a problem, of assuming you actually solve the problem and the problem is interesting and important, that I consider to be research. Um, Another question I'm often asked is, is this perfect? And the answer is definitely no, this is not perfect. But I think the better question is, is this better than what we can do without mass collaboration? So for example, when people look at the data from eBird, they say, oh my goodness, there's so many problems with this data. Uh, how could you do this? But there are certain things that you can answer with that data that you could not answer in other ways. And so, rather than focusing on what's perfect, which I think is good to keep in mind, I think we should also keep in mind with what is possible without mass collaboration. And if mass collaboration enables new things, that's important even if it is not yet perfect. Um, is this impossible? Sometimes people think that this is like, some of these things that we'll talk about are very difficult and it's very hard to do, and maybe a lot of these projects fail uh, but I think a better question is, is this possible? So I think Wikipedia is a wonderful example of showing what is possible. And I think scientists haven't spent a lot of time doing their research when this stuff was all possible. So many of the people who, who have done research before us whose ideas we draw on, they were living in a different time with different capabilities. And so the fact that they did not do these things doesn't mean that they were not good ideas. It just means they couldn't do them. They were like literally unable to do them. So I think we are the first scientists who are living in a time where this is technologically possible, and I think also where it's sort of socially understood as being possible. So the idea of user-generated content, for example, 10 years ago, that was just a weird idea, and people didn't really feel super comfortable with that, and now it's just like normal. Like, to you, all user-generated content is probably just a normal thing that you've lived with your whole lives. But many um, people, that's not a world that they grew up in, and so it feels unusual. So I think we should focus on what is possible. Um, and then, to be really clear, I'm gonna tell some, provide some examples of what I think are amazing projects, but I think 
also, while I was working on this part of Bit by Bit, I also read about a lot of projects that were failures. So I want to be really clear that I am absolutely only going to tell you about successful projects. I'm not going to tell you about the failures. So most mass collaborations fail. And what that means for you is that you should really um, think of this as like a high risk, potentially high return kind of research activity. And as such, you should design it in that way where, for example, you want to have quickly a proof of concept before you start investing a lot in custom software development and so on. So you can think of it kind of like a startup. And if it's not going to work, you want to find out very quickly that it's not going to work rather than invest a year in creating some infrastructure. It turns out people aren't going to be excited about. OK? Any questions about mass collaboration? Any questions from the live stream? OK, we'll move to the next uh, section.